At FTC Fridays, we're taking a look at some of the most creative robots to be made in the FTC Decode season this week. Matches are being lost here because of that. And this is a critical example. I'm Coach Pratt, and I've been teaching robotics and design for over a decade now, and I've mentored FTC teams to winning national championships. And today we're going to take a look at some interesting strategies that you might want to try out to make a kickstand base that I haven't yet seen, some shooting while moving algorithms, talk about some pitfalls you might want to try to avoid with intakes, and then diagnose a few matches that have been swung really hard from playing some good defense and baiting opponents into perhaps breaking some rules. So we'll see how that goes. So first things here, we've got teams uh, Atomic Liquitabs, and I want to share off their little uh, kick mechanism here for basing. They were able to drive the robot up, kick themselves up on a little kickstand, but the thing I like about this little kickstand is it's also set up on two small, I think those are 32 millimeter Omni wheels from Go Build Out, although it could also be a 35 mil from Rotocaster. Uh, and I think this is a great way of using a kickstand but still allow your team to drive around with that kickstand. So it, it's reducing their base significantly, and they can still move around with that base. Because one of the things I've seen with these kickstand systems is that you can't move once you have that set up. And if you don't have this thing fine-tuned right from the get-go, you could end up missing out on some critical points, or if you need to shuffle over so that your partner can get in a little better, uh, you might miss out on that. So good work here, team uh, 18809. Another example here is uh, team Dino Knot 27572. They've got a large gear system on the outside here uh, that as it follows a similar kind of idea, and it looks like that is also a wheel. So while it might not be able to drive forward or backwards, it is a, bit, a little bit of a, a kickstand or a little hitch. It's got a lot of torque on that, and it's clearly able to lift the robot up to be able to get it around. They clearly just have a pretty high gear ratio set up to a servo for this one. One thing I am concerned about doing this design, and this is clearly just a prototype that they slapped on top of the robot, is they're clearly going to have to mount this inside their robot somewhere. Because a big challenge with doing something like this is that it's going to get run. Now, clearly, their final design is not going to be this long, but I think this is a really slick, quick way of showing off how you can use a simple uh, geared mechanism with a long bar attached to one of the gears so that you can get a rotation and kick your robot up and effectively get a pretty quick ability to have two robots inside of one base. Next up, we've got some shooting here. Uh, we've got shooting while moving from the turtle walkers. I believe that this is, uh, I'm not sure what team number it is. We'll have to see as it runs around. It is 19745. So they've got, and this is the first robot that I've seen do this well, despite missing <laughs> that first shot. Uh, they are capable of firing a couple shots while moving. Now, it looks like most of their shots show two. I'm not sure if that's because the robot's only capable of picking up two, or if that's just what it is that they're showing off for this case. In any case, this is some seriously impressive work to be able to have a robot that is able to continuously track and fire while it's moving. I think that's going to be an absolutely critical skill if teams want to get high up in the decode rankings and especially as we'll see later in this video some of the really intense defense that we had i've managed to find an even crazier defense match than the previous ones we showed in the last week just to show you just how much pushing is going around here so having a little bit more pushing uh, will really make your robot a lot more effective and then being able to move that turret to fire at the same time we've also got team uh, quicksilver 8404 as well they also have a shooting while moving algorithm setting up here. Now, I'm not sure if this is just a quick shot, if they have more things working on as it's firing around. In any case, it's still a great shot when shooting while moving. And I think this is going to be a critical piece for teams to set up to build a fine success, especially at really high levels inside of the decode season. And it's really impressive to already be seeing things like this happening in such a short time frame. Next up here, we've got a Spindexer here from Swing FTC. I really want to show this one off just because I really like what Swing is doing here. Taking a lot of time, this is V3, and then doing a very close image as they're being able to show this and show a video. So you can actually see their whole design process that goes up. I love when teams are being more open about their designs and sharing things out for other teams to be able to see and diagnose and take a look at how some of this clever engineering is happening. And I think that's really fantastic to be able to open up your designs for other teams to be able to see. 
I am seeing a good chunk of teams use positional servos for this index. And while I do think that it makes it easier for these teams to be able to figure out where slots are put in and be able to shoot slot one, slot two, slot three, you'll notice that you are going to run into issues where you just cannot get crazy high throughput through these things. Because sure, it is easy to figure out where exactly these slots are going to be. But you run the risk of not being able to get a high enough throughput once it is going through. And especially at high levels, being able to have a much higher throughput, I think is going to be really important this season. Next up here, we've got team 23849. And they have a really interesting way of doing indexing here. So if we take a look at this, they have almost a bit of a carousel going on internally inside of their robot. So this isn't necessarily a spindex, and I'd love to get a closer look to see how it is that this is working, but it looks like it's got like a standard boot kicker wheels that are sending the robot around in a vertical kind of system here. It's a really unique way of having a single channel or a single column for your robot to be able to come in on because it's quite a narrow base uh, to be able to bring this in and to still have indexing capabilities. And the nice thing is, it might not be as slow as it looks for this indexing as well, because realistically, you only have to index and move one ball out of the way in order to be able to know whether you've got two purples or a green, because you only have to know if it's green or purple. So you don't actually have to cycle through three balls. You only have to cycle through two or at minimum, at least one to be able to get it is what you're doing. I think this is a really clever technique here from 23849. I'm looking forward to them taking this and developing it more in the future. Next up here, we've got an intake. And unfortunately, I don't know what team this is. Their team number is not clearly shown. And one thing I want to highlight on here is a danger for teams to avoid. I think that this is working really well when their system is set up perfectly in all three. I don't know if this is a calibration system in that when they come pick this up, it does set all three in the exact position they would expect right from the start there. But we did see that as they're picking things up here, that it is moving things slightly too high up at that point that is already up in their flywheel and they have to end up backing it back down and i think this is a cautionary tale for teams that are using uh, long linear sections they're gonna have to find some way of stopping that artifact and that ball from getting up into their flywheel shooter off of that point they need some sort of gate mechanism some sort of secondary transfer point so it's very crystal clear to that robot that it does not come up because having to stop specific motors on things, in my experience, depending on how you have this set up, is simply not a good enough design to program your way out of this. There has to be some sort of mechanical stop to be able to make this easier for your team and your programs to know when that ball needs to hit the flywheel and when it does not. Next up here, I want to just talk about a really cool little intake here. Uh, unfortunately, there's no robot team on this one, so I can't be able to share this off. If you know it, please let me know in the comments down below. And they've got a nice little pusher here. And I wanted to highlight this one because I think that uh, this is a really simple way that makes it easy for your team to be able to move things around on the field. Not only does it start to glide that artifact into the center point, but it's not terribly difficult to design. Uh, this one looks 3D printed, but it also wouldn't be hard to make something like this out of cardboard or out of polycarbonate sheet or something like that, just to get yourself a bit more of an angle so that it's easier for you to push things around, especially if you're on the newer side of FTC. And you don't have a good way of pushing things around a flat bar, giving yourself that little bit of an angle for those artifacts to be able to come and scoop in as you're pushing them around is going to make your robot that much more effective. And it's a really quick win that you can build. So I want to share that one out. Next up here, we've got a team from Betabots FTC. And they have a, I believe this is a nine ball autonomous with, it looks like it's indexed as well because they have a sort of 45 degree indexer on their robot, which is pretty slick. And I think that's uh, something that we might see more of this season as well. Oh, it is an indexed uh, intake as well. I think that's really cool for teams to be able to have this set up and have an autonomous that's functioning like this and actually working, uh, especially when you've got things running like this. One thing I think that's going to be really important for teams, especially at this high point, is that last half second right there. Uh, and I've been talking about this a lot all season, is that this team just lost three points, but it's not so much they lost three points, they lost a big chance to be able to get that ranking point. 
And that ranking point is going to be so important this season when you're making a win because it provides at least three points towards that leave. And especially now that we know that in regionals, for your qualifying tournaments, it's 16 points to be able to get a ranking point for leave. But I believe that it is 21 points for your regional tournament, which means you need to have both robots leaving and one and a half robots fully back to base or two robots fully back to base. I think that most of the community can agree at this point that two robots back to base is a significantly more challenging mechanically design than to have a simple autonomous that just moves you off that base. And it would be such a shame to have teams that have impressive autonomous like this, nine artifacts in, fully indexed, three per artifact, nine, 18, 27, an additional 18 points for that target that gets you up to 45 points and then missing out on those three to get to 48 that's a really high autonomous but to be able to get that many points and miss out on that ranking point really would be a shame to have your paths that tight because this one technically does not count as a leave so i just want to make really clear to teams you have to get those three points in the end because they're worth more than getting one extra ball in particularly in that ranking point system Last up here, I want to talk about two different matches that show up here. So we've got a uh, decode Washington State record here from the team Red. We've got Seattle Solvers here, and that is team 23511 and uh, 16965. Unfortunately, I don't know the team of this one. Now, the cool thing about this 23511 robot is they do have a swerve drive. And you can see just how quickly this thing's able to move. But the highlight here is I want you to show how these teammates are working together in this match as well as looking at the high throughput and how a high throughput really does help improve systems so take a look at 23511 here as it's able to shoot through i believe it pops out three here relatively quickly it takes a moment for it to target on the april tag it looks like their camera is not quite aligned up at the start here but once it does get fully initialized looks like it had to pre properly initialize there once they're able to intake it and check out how quickly you can fire three here quite a high throughput and also quite high accuracy is going to be a, a really killer point here next i want to show this 16965 and just how important having a wide intake is going to be this season because let's see if i can find that uh, system here as it moves forward because they do have quite a good robot but as it comes around to their intake i think their intake is not quite wide enough right here so they, well, they're coming on over and they try to get in here this is a good play from blue to be able to stop this red team for be able to come up and grab this large section of artifacts but watch this tries to get all three here it actually ends up grabbing none of those as it runs in there so despite having quite an impressive shot uh, as it's running in it's not capable of moving some balls out of the way and because of that you end up running into issues where you're trying to intake balls but you just can't intake balls reliably enough and this is something I've seen from other teams as well, is that their intakes are just not quite wide enough or not quite fast enough. A good rule of thumb on an intake, seven, whatever your drive wheel motors are, whatever their RPM is, try to at least double that for your intake. And that gives you enough speed to be able to grab an artifact and it automatically comes into your robot. I think that's a really critical piece for this. And that's uh, one thing I think teams should be focusing on more of as well. In any case, really impressive match here from these teams and then let's go take a look at the last match of the day which has some really intense defense here so particularly and this team in red right now i believe has the highest opr or one of these two teams at least the time of recording had one of the highest scores in the world at the moment uh, and i want you to take a look at the defense that's being played from blue here because this is a really high defense game in fact you can see here from uh, 26 357 just how scraped up the robot is on the side so we're about to get into tally up here and uh, let's just take a look at how blue is able to just bully around this red team quite significantly i think that a lot of teams are and you know they're and kudos to this blue team for pushing right back as well having it a driver that is able to react to your other team coming up and pushing i think is going to be critical this year so as we saw back here let's come back a little bit we're going to see watch this bottom right hand corner this blue robot's going to come up in this section they come and knock this uh, blue robot out of the way 
They're still legal for shooting, but they don't get any fouls here. But this robot here should be preparing for the red robot to come back and smack into them. And you can see that they're now pushed out of the shooting zone. If they had continued to drive backwards into that blue robot, they would have been able to hold things off a little bit better or have a little bit of a preliminary setup here. Now take a look how red here is going to be bullying blue back in this uh, section here coming up in a bit of a corner. And these two are just tagging it out and great work on blue for playing this defense. You can see that while red is typically able to score a lot higher, you have some really impressive robots here with quite high scoring capabilities. And you're only getting a score of about 60 to 21 partway into this. And I think this is another one of those things by having a really heavy bot that's not able to get pushed around on the field. Or having a really agile bot that's able to move while shooting is going to be really, really critical this season because of just like, look just how much defense is happening inside here. Some of these robots just can't even move uh, for a good three, six, nine seconds as they're all just kind of getting stuck up and pushing. Now, one thing I think that is happening here is these teams might be going a little excessive in playing the defense and that some teams might not even have balls here up and loaded and not even thinking about which one it is that they're trying to get in and score as well. And what's really interesting about this match is Blue actually ends up winning here. And they end up winning for the most part, at least as far as I can tell, in the last few seconds of the match here. So now comes the critical time to take a look at that you are not contacting robots inside of the opposing alliance's base. So as blue comes back in here, watch what red is doing. I don't think red is paying attention to, and blue, I don't know if that was intentional as they knock back in there, but red was pushing blue into their section as they're coming in. So it's possible that blue got them so riled up to be able to get it. And then the same thing happens here again. Red comes up and contacts them several times. So despite red being well above inside of this match in terms of scores, they actually end up losing the match for themselves in the last little bit there for not keeping track of that end goal time. And I think that's definitely something that teams are going to get caught up in. Is they're going to get caught up in the excitement of the match and caught up in the intensity of the defense and the intensity of the play that's happening, just keeping track of that time. So we look for as far as scoring goes, red wholeheartedly outscored blue. However, blue got 30 points for the full base and three contacts. I believe that that was from three contacts on that base from red into blue as well. So it actually ended up being a full 75 point swing in fouls all done from the very end of that so this is a good uh, learning experience for teams to really make sure you avoid the other team's base zone in those last 20 seconds make it very clear to your drivers during those last 20 seconds make a light flash in your robot make a vibrating controller happen do something visible do several things visible for your driver to let them know that you're going into this end game and to not touch the opposing alliance's base zone because matches are being lost here because of that. And this is a critical example of this for a qualifier match six. They are, oh, actually, this is playoff match six. They are losing because of penalties, and that's really going to affect things this game. If you're looking for more robotics advice, resources, things like that, you can consider joining my community down below. If you have a match you want me to take a look at or you think other people would benefit from seeing, submit it down on the FTC Friday submission form down below. Or if you've got a part of your robot that you want to show with the community, submit it on the comments down below, and I'll do my best to take a look at this and possibly feature it in another FTC Fridays. And as always, best of luck out there this FTC season.